Yeah, there is a delay. Is okay. there anything I have to do about that? No, no, no. It's a, it's, it's okay. We are ready. Uh, we are on YouTube. We have a, like a two minutes delay, but it's, it's, it's normal. But, but they can, they can that already people will see. see people will see two minutes later than I talk. Yeah, like time? one minute. Yeah, one minute, two minutes because it's a live transmission, Sorry so there off. is a, a a delay. But okay, no problem. Yeah. So let me know when. Yes. So it means we'll start late uh, sooner. Yeah, we can. Or 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 we we'll just start, start two minutes later. Or how is it? Because yeah, people will start. connect. Because people will connect at the time, right? Yeah, yeah, we can start. I think. But yeah, yeah, maybe in, in one minute. So if we have two minutes delayed. Yeah, yeah. yeah. in one minute we can start. But people are still coming, so usually okay. it takes uh, it's yeah, normal. few minutes. Yeah, yeah, we can take it until the exact time. It's okay. I will uh, be in the background, okay? And I come back in the end. See you. Oh. Sorry, <laughs> that was very front. <laughs> and you can you can hear me fine. Do I need to adjust anything? It's all okay. It's okay. Yeah, it's okay. So let's go. So hello everyone, warm greetings from Brazil. I am Rena Huda. I am part of the CR committee of the Brazilian Association of Luminology. So on behalf of our group, welcome. Thank you so much for your time. Uh, this workshop is the second one of a three that we are promoting previously to the SIL Congress in Brazil this year. Uh, you can find the first uh, workshop video down here in the subscription with uh, David Hamilton. But today we are thrilled to announce as a speaker, Mariana Menhoff. Uh, Mariana is a full professor in the Department of Ecology and Environmental Management at the Universidade de la República, Uruguay. A full professor in the postgraduate program for the development uh, of basic science and also associated to the Department of Ecoscience in Aarhus University in Denmark as an honorary associate research. Her research include climate uh, warming and land use, freshwater quality and restoration of degraded ecosystem, uh, environmental and social impacts of food production and interaction between science, policy making, and environmental manage management. She has more than 100 peer review papers published, a dose of book chapters, and one book published also. She's a member of several editorial boards of scientific journal and has already received the Roberto Caldeiras Barcia Award in Geoscience. Uruguay, uh, the International Recognition for Professional Excellence in Limnology by the International Ecology Institute in Germany, the L'Oreal UNESCO Award for Women uh, in Science Uruguay, and the Newman Team Medal by SIL. Welcome, Mariana. Thanks so much for accepting our invitation. Uh, like, let me explain something. You will have around 30 minutes for your presentation. Okay, of course, and after that, around 15 minutes for questions and the interaction with our uh, audience. 
So guys, please send your questions in the chat. Don't worry about the language. Uh, our group will be happy to translate it for Mariana. And of course, all questions are welcome, okay? Mariana? Okay. <clears throat> Many thanks, Renan and Lorena, for the invitation to participate in these fantastic workshops that you're organizing. Um, well, you asked me to, you gave me this title uh, to prepare this talk, and I will be giving some notes and thoughts about how important it is to do scientific research and to get it published while we are researchers in the global south. And I will share some tips that I have learned through mostly about from my editorial work. And I have to say for this talk, I, I get also some inputs from David Hamilton with whom we, we share some concerns about the Global South researchers and who gave the first of these workshops. So thanks to everyone for being here today. And I hope that this challenge of presenting my slides in Spanish, but talking in English is not chaotic. Let's see how it goes. So why is it important to have diversity in science? because diversity in science is the same as diversity in nature. So diversity promotes more diversity and diversity promotes more productivity. And we need a diverse scientific community to get a better understanding on how ecosystems work at a global scale and to better evaluate the ecological theories, which are mostly produced in the North when I say north, it's it's a not geographic, uh, exactly right. So it's a it's a kind of loose term, but I I hope everybody more or less know what we mean when we talk about global south and global north. So most of the theories were built in systems and ecosystems that are in the north, and therefore they don't necessarily fit with the rest of the world. Most likely they don't. So we need to have a diverse global research community if we have to understand the function of nature. And we need to get a higher impact of research and scientific innovation, because that will give better opportunities to solve environmental problems at all scales. So to have a stronger, diverse researcher community will also contribute to understand and to help solve global problems because there's a lot of information on how nature works all over the world, not just from one spot trying to see how the world works, right? So we need everyone if we have to face these global challenges that the planet is facing today and also at the local level. So we need strong, prestigious, recognized researcher communities working at the local level because they will know best how to contribute to find solutions. So that's all these reasons that explain why we need to increase diversity in the scientific community. But what's the situation? In the academic world, we've seen this evolution shown in this cartoon that we are all in need to publish. And it's common to hear the publish or perish. So if we don't publish, we're out of the system. And that has become even stronger and stronger. The pressure is not just to publish, it's to publish in high impact journals or perish. So you're out of the academic system. And lately, and in many parts of the world, it's not just publish and high impact, it's published a lot in high impact journals and maybe you won't be out of the system. So the pressure on the academic world is enormous and it's often internal pressure so that the system is creating feedbacks to increase this pressure. But we'll see that this pressure is much more difficult to lift when you belong to certain groups. And this is how I see this. These are the three main sources of disadvantage or barriers 
for researchers. So age or the stage in the career, in the academic career, is one major disadvantage. Gender is the second major set, let's say, of disadvantage. And origin and the context that is associated with origin, and it's the third and, in my view, the largest. And of course, these different uh, sources of disadvantages or barriers for researchers interact with each other and they, they overlap. So we have groups that are extremely vulnerable to all these pressures because of all these barriers are accumulating on top of each other. And origin and context, it means many different things. So it means different uh, access to resources, so different economies. So most economies in the global south are weak, much weaker, meaning the academia is also uh, lacking resources, lacking infrastructure, and lacking um, sustained support. So where also many countries in the global south are more um, unstable politically, meaning that also the support or lack of support to design, to science or to local science also is shifting. So this 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 increases the fragility of the system. We have language barrier and we have to face prejudiced, unbiased, very often unconscious bias regarding uh, ethnicity, religion, geopolitical and cultural backgrounds. And also there is the symbolic context. So some locations have, maybe they don't have as much resources, but they have a more symbolic power in the, in the worldview. And therefore it's not equally easy or difficult to get your work published, depending on where you come from, because you have to face all these problems. And I will go quickly over each of them and I will be showing in my talk different papers that are dealing with these issues and that I encourage you to read because they are, they are providing fantastic data and also a lot of um, suggestions on how to overcome this barrier. So I said age or the academic, the stage in your academic life is one major disadvantage. And why is that? So I will be calling the ECR. So these are the early career researchers, which are probably young, but that changes from place to place. And of course it changes with your own life, but early in your career, let's call it young researchers. These are a group of people that are very vulnerable, especially today in the, with the rules of the academic world today. And there's a series of reasons why this group of researchers is extremely vulnerable. vulnerable. One is the high insecurity, the high uh, insecurity in terms of positions, in terms of salary. Most of these young researchers are offered short-term contracts, a few years, so they have this high instability regarding their income and uh, facilities where they will be working, even the location, even in which country they will be working. Also, this stage in the academic life, so that, that would be a few years after you finish your PhD, basically, so or the time that you're producing your first papers. So very often, this stage in the academic life coincides with a stage in your personal life where you have to take very important decisions like where to live. Will you buy a house? Will you rent a place? Will you build a family? Will you have children? So these decisions are more or less happening at the same time. And therefore, so there's a lot of um, pressure on the people at this stage because of this insecurity. And at the same time, most often you don't have your own resources. So you have scarcity of economical funds or resources, but 
All that happens while you're getting a huge pressure to publish, to produce papers, and they should be of high impact on top. So that because of these reasons, this group is very fragile within the academic system. And that becomes, it's becoming worse, I think, with the current model of open access for publishing, that it's gaining um, strength within the publishing system. And that gives, that the next talk in this workshop will focus on open access, so I hope there will be interesting debates there. But one of the questions that underlies the open access model is who pays and who earns, who wins with this system? So, in theory, the open access is supposed to increase democracy within the scientific world because most research is paid by public funds and if the results of the scientific work, if the research, like the publications, are open to download and open to read by everyone, that's of course more democratic because the people in each country is paying through taxes research and that they can have access to that research results. That's fantastic. But moving the weight of who pays for the cost of publishing, which by the way, it's the gains of the editorials are super high. It's one of the most ludicrous uh, enterprises in the world. So they get a huge benefit, economic benefit with little um, little cost, because most of the cost of publishing, it's on the scientists. Because as a researcher, we write them, we prepare the materials, we write the papers, the papers get reviewed by fellow colleagues who are not paid, and then there are the editors who are paid very little for the amount of work and the responsibility that they have. So it's a lot of money going into the editorials, and now the authors are supposed to pay to get the open access happening. And that imposes new barriers to the researchers in the global south, and particularly to the young researchers, because they would need to cut their thin budget and put several thousands of dollars into getting your paper open. And that's money that goes out of your research, and that implies probably less salaries for young researchers or less opportunities. And on top, rich countries are having agreements with the big editorials, and therefore it's cheaper for them. So in my personal view, this model is increasing inequality in the systems, and we have to be very aware of that. So then we move to gender. And here, I show in the figure this very nice study, very recent, that focused on women in limnology. And the authors in this paper, they show how there's a self-representation of women in limnology in key aspects of the academic life. So we have here the amount of women offering plenary talks in different congresses, the amount of awards received by women, the amount of women in scientific boards of congresses and the amount of women in editorial boards of different journals. And this line is the 50%. So if there was an equal representation of women, then there should be at least 50. And you can see that for all these activities that are very important to give visibility, prestige and recognition women, except for a few cases, women are highly self-represented. And that shows different things, but one is that there is bias based on gender in the academic system. And also indicates that there are very few or weak mechanisms to keep women in the system, in the academia, so to avoid loosening women and to facilitate women to grow within the academia. So there's a lot of measures that are discussed that could promote this and I encourage you to read this paper to find some of these suggestions.
but that clearly indicates that women are sub-represented in the activity in the academia and in the scientific activity and the publications as well. And then we move to the third source of barriers or disadvantages for researchers, which is origin. And here we see the amount of articles published according to geographic origin in general ecology. This is a paper reviewing all ecological papers in the last few decades. And then we see how the world map becomes if standardized by the amount of papers published in ecology. And we see then that the global north, which is basically Europe, North America, and Australia, and New Zealand, despite they're in the southern hemisphere, and they belong to what is called the deep south, that's another terminology, they have the most papers published in ecology. Look at South America and look at Africa and some parts of Asia as well. And this happens to coincide with the places of the world that host the higher biodiversity and that are facing the current greatest environmental challenges. And that's where we don't get enough publications, so reflecting that we don't know enough of these areas and that we don't have the scientific communities that work in these areas being recognized or visible in the international spectrum of publications. So if we go deeper in that, so this is another study that focused on the top publications in ecology. And they, they, uh, they studied the geographical origin of the authors. So this would be the authors that published the most amount, the higher amount of papers in the top journals in ecology. Top journals by their impact factor. And they found this very clear relationship that the higher the income in, of the country, the more uh, authors are considered top in ecology, meaning there are more publications in relevant ecological journals. That means they are setting the agenda, they are describing the theory, they are testing the theory, and there, there is this clear positive relationship with income. And here we see the amount of authors, so this is not amount of paper, it's people that are publishing in this top, not just top journals, they're publishing a lot in those journals. That's what this article shows, and we see the countries that have the most uh, amount of scientists publishing in ecology. So the US, the UK, Australia, and Europe largely. And a few of the other countries, part of the global styles that are super highly underrepresented. And the same for women. So there are very few women among the top authors in ecology. So that brings to different questions and highlights what I was mentioning at the beginning, that we need to be everyone involved if we have to understand the global problems that the planet is facing. So there are many papers that aim to be global and they're showing global data. But then if you see, you'd want to, uh, I don't show here the, num the names of the authors, but their origin. None of the authors in this global paper belongs to the global south. So if we want to talk about what happens to everyone, then everyone should participate. Because otherwise, we're missing a lot of super important knowledge. We're missing local and regional knowledge that prevents from a proper understanding of what happens, what's happening with the environment and with the waters in different parts of the world and difficult and making it difficult to find the right solutions for those problems. So there is 
and slow increase in the international collaboration in ecology and technology, but it's still very low. So we're talking about less than 15% of all the papers published that have an international consortium, a truly international consortium in the authors, in the list of authors. And that brings another issue, which is fairness. We need this collaboration to be fair. And there's often seen what is called the neo-colonialism or the helicopter science, where science or the research is led by researchers from a few countries, most normally in the North, and with a few local researchers invited to collect the data and not to really participate in the design and, and in the interpretation of such data. So we need to be careful about that and we need to be very, we, I mean everyone, because there could be some unconscious bias from many people and also uh, we as researchers from the global south, we have to promote very actively that this international collaboration is fair and that we are really participating in the construction of knowledge. So this origin brings many barriers, as I was mentioning at the beginning, and I will just focus on one, which is perhaps the most obvious, which is language. And scientific language nowadays is English, and that presents some advantages that we have a common language. But we have to have in mind that 95% of the world population does not speak English as native tongue. And there are studies showing that language is promoting many barriers at different stages of the academic life and the academic production, the scientific activity, and that young researchers, so the early career researchers, are affected the most by the language barrier. And that in particular, that is preventing or difficulty the interaction of the young researchers with a broader community. So not feeling confident with English, it's making a lot of people not go to conferences and avoid giving oral presentations. If they go to congresses, they will avoid oral presentations or they will avoid contacting researchers from other places. And this has an impact on the visibility of the work and on the networking, which is crucial to overcome the limitations that we face. So in this very nice article that I recommend everyone to read, they, they have compared the time needed to produce publications or to attend congresses or to get your work out there because of the language. So they have compared people, researchers, young and established, that are native English speakers with those that are non-native English speakers. And for every activity, from reading a paper, writing your own paper, getting it published. So this, it's much more difficult for non-native English speakers. So look at this, the amount of times that the paper is asked to be revised because of the language, more than 12 times more than for native speakers. And the time needed to prepare a presentation if you decide to go to, to a Congress and how you decide to participate. So that is making a big burden for people that doesn't speak English as a native tongue to be visible and to get your work out in the international arena. There are other barriers that are also affecting, and I would put that in, in a different category, but it's also something uh, relevant and that it's difficult in the true participation of people in the construction of global science, which is the time zone. So now that the virtual world after the pandemic has become to stay, 
then we're seeing that most of the working meetings, workshops, virtual congresses, they are planned in terms of the working hours of Europe or North America. And that's it's making a lot of people in the deep south and in the global south not to be able to attend or to have more limitations. And of course, attending, there are several advantages of the virtual world, but also some disadvantages because that to be active in these worlds, in this virtual world, you need to have strong, stable internet connection, and that doesn't happen everywhere or always. So there are new possibilities and new challenges that we need to have in mind to overcome this. So why these publications are so important? Because the more publications, the more recognition of the world, the more uh, sites the papers have, the more invitations to review you get, and the more funding you get, the more research you can do, then the more publications. And this is a positive feedback. And there are ways, uh, internal mechanisms that make it that for the, let's call, global north, they start with better chances because of all these things that we discussed before. So there are more publications. More publications means more prestige, more recognition. So more invitations to give plenary talks, more invitations to sit in editorial boards, more revisions of other people's paper, more quotations of your own papers, more funding. And all that gets more publication. And then you have this loop that is increasing the bridge between north and south. The opposite with this. Uh, researchers from that suffer from these disadvantages. There are less publications to start with. If you have less publications, you're less visible, and therefore your work gets less cited. And then you don't get as many invitations to review other people's work, and then you learn that's missing opportunities to learn and improve your writing capacity. Then you have less of that, and then you have even less publications, less funding, less recognition, and this loop, this positive feedback that we need to break. And then, for now, we'll use the rest of the minutes to discuss how it's important to break these cycles. So what most people are seeing as relevant for a successful academic career is to get published in respected journal. That's most researchers, more than 50% of researchers, seeing this getting published in respected journals as one of the most important achievements, and then get cited in respected journals as the second. So how do we do that if we are researchers in the Global South? Or we face, we're not in the Global South, but we face some of these barriers that I talked at the beginning. You're a young researcher, you are female or feminized researcher or part of a minority, and you have some of the reasons that are associated with bias, like religion, ethnicity, and cultural context that prevents you from being at a better stage to get your academic career. So I will share now a few tips that I've learned mostly as, as a, working as an editor in several journals what are the most um, common reasons of rejection for authors of the Global South? And one is to focus your work uh, to not realizing that our work is not necessarily relevant for the international audience, just because it's, it has never been done in our country or in our lake, or in our stream, or in our river, or they're done with our favorite species. So that doesn't mean, even if we love it, it doesn't mean it's going to be relevant for the international scientific community. There's often a too narrow scope. So focus in one species or in one taxonomic group without a broader context. And very, very often, works from the Global South are purely descriptive. 
So there are no hypotheses, no theoretical framework. And that's a conflict in a way, because as I was saying before, most places that belong to the Global South are understudied. So there's still a lot that we don't know. There's still many species that need to be found for the, and described for the first time, many ecosystems that has never been any research conducted there. But at the same time that we generate new basic knowledge on our natural systems, we do need to have a strong theoretical background and to have hypotheses if we want to decrease the chances of getting rejected. Then we have poor English. As I was saying before, this is easier to solve nowadays for the writing of the paper at least, and inappropriate statistics. Those are the most common reasons I found for rejection of papers coming from the global styles. But if we want to increase the chances of getting our work accepted, so I will share a few tips that are, of course, my personal view, and I would be happy to discuss with you guys. So some tips to increase the impact of research. First, to know, be updated, and to question the theoretical frameworks that are specific to your, your topic, and to develop hypotheses to test, to have uh, relatively high complexity or increase the complexity of the work. For example, combining approaches, experiments, field work, field experiments, models, etc. So the more, uh, the, the stronger combination of different approaches will make your research of potentially higher impact. Then consider the implications to different levels of ecological organization. So if you're working on a species, then think about the mechanisms behind whatever you observe and the potential implications for the population, community, or ecosystem levels, because that will allow you to generate new hypotheses that other people will start working on. Have in mind the implications for other regions and also what your research can provide for the theoretical at the theoretical level, so for, for the theoretical frameworks, what are your implications that could enrich or challenge what is thought to be behind whatever field you're working? And then be updated in the statistics, in the analysis of your data. So that's a crucial aspect as well. And then search for real and fair cooperation with other colleagues in your country, in your region, and at the global scale. And try and look for diverse cooperation. So people with different, different stages of the career, of different genders, of different origins. So that's where we have to break, where most of the works that we're uh, doing in the Global Styles are very often following what it's produced before. And we need to challenge that. We need to try and break that low impact of our research because it has a huge potential as we've seen in the last decades. So uh, now a few tips to increase the potential impact of the papers and also to improve the peer review system. So these topics, some of them were already discussed in the talk by David Hamilton a few weeks ago, and I will go through them again, and some are new. So first is to choose the right journal. And here, what is the right journal? You have to consider the prestige of that journal, which is not necessarily the same as the impact factor, and because impact factor is, can reflect the speed so many people would like a journal because it's very fast in their revision and then the publication time which is of course very relevant and it's getting more relevant in the, in the last years but that is often inflating impact factor of journals that are not so serious in the peer review uh, part of the work right so 
search for Germans that are recognized, that are prestigious. That's much better than just focusing on the impact factor. And always, always avoid predatory Germans and non-ethical Germans, because that can be very tempt tempting because they are offer fast publication, but very often they come with no review or very bad, very lousy review, very bad quality review, and that will hit you. So always avoid these journals. Then when once you have chosen your journal, just follow very clearly the guidelines. That will save you work and save you time. And then when you're writing your paper, if we want to break this loop and we want to increase and make the system more fair, then we, as consumers of science, we also have decisions to choose from. And we can choose who we cite. And we need to, to cite ethically, which means we need to cover, if the same was said by different researchers, let's try and recognize the contributions done by people from different locations, from different genders, from different stages of their career, because being cited is one of the metrics that increases the working opportunities for many people, right? So we need to have that in mind when we choose who to cite. Then there are tools to improve the English in the writing and get uh, have more chances of not being rejected just by the English. So there are artificial intelligence tools that can help us, but we need to use them responsibly. We need to be careful not to overuse and not to work on the content. The content should be ours, but the English can be very improved if we use these tools wisely. We need, number six, we need to avoid wasting time of the system. So don't, if we are wasting the time of the editor and the reviewers, they will get angry and then angry. Reviewer is not something we want if we want our paper to be out there. So we need a solid letter to the editor and to mention different reviewers. And these different reviewers to our paper, it's another opportunity to increase the diversity in the academic system. So let's offer reviewers at different stages of their career. Let's offer the top scientists, but the young scientists as well, because that's more likely that the young scientists will accept reviewing a paper than the top, the old professor. So young scientists, scientists from different places, scientists we know belong to a minority. So let's, that's also another way that we have to make a better and more fair and more just peer review system. And then when we are, so we our paper got the first part, and we are getting the comments and criticisms by reviewers and editors, we need to work a lot on the response, a lot. And I, I don't stress that enough. We need to provide exhaustive and very clear responses. Because if we want, if again, if if we don't do that, we're wasting people's time and they get angry and they don't want, they're not so happy to reread the same paper many times because we didn't hear, we didn't read properly what the questions or the criticism were and we're, done, we're not explaining how we dealt with those questions. So use as much as time as possible and provide a very long, if needed, and extensive and clear responses that will increase your chances of getting published a lot, believe me. So, uh, one phrase that my old uh, master's professor, Brian Moss, was saying to me when we were discussing the journals, he said, shoot at the stars, just don't forget there is gravity. So let's try our best when we choose the journal, but it's there there are chances, high chances that we we will get rejected. So let's get friends with rejection. That will happen always in our career. But let's try the best that we can. Shoot at the stars. And then once that our work is there, we need to also 
increase our own visibility and the visibility of our work. And for that, I here share a few tips I think that can be done at the individual level. And one is being proactive. Don't be shy. Offer yourself to be reviewers and to be part of editorial boards, if you're invited, of respected journals, not predatory journals, not unethical journals, respected journals. So just contact somebody that you may know that belongs to the editorial board and say, hey, I'm available. I would like to review papers. Just consider me. I work in this, this and that, and I will be very happy to be considered as a reviewer. Also go to the old professors and say, I would be happy to help. Please teach me how to review. I will help in the, if you get an invitation, I could do it and then you supervise me. So be proactive because you learn a lot when you review somebody's, somebody else's work. And when you work with a journal, you really learn a lot and you improve how you produce your own papers. Another tip, just follow key researchers and their students, the young researchers that were uh, part or that are part of their labs and follow respected journals to keep yourself updated, and keep yourself inspired of what else is happening there. Contact researchers, don't be shy. Again, most people out there are nice, not everyone, but most people will be happy to be contacted, especially from somebody outside your institution, outside your country, and then start building your own network. Most importantly, contact your peers, the other young researchers in courses, in congresses. You need to establish your own personal links and you need to start, and you need to, to build trust because all these uh, changes in the system are actually done by people, right? So these people that you meet in international congresses, this will be your colleagues and your friends in your academic life. So, still in Foz de Iguazú is a fantastic opportunity. Drink your caperinhas and talk about your research with the most people that you can. And that will have, you will see the fruits later. And also, if you want to increase the visibility and the recognition, of your research, because doing research is, can be very painful and hard, we all know, and then we want people to know the findings. So let's share in the social media, in English and in your local language. So both, it's more work for us, not native speakers in English. Of course, we know that, but we need to reach as many people as possible and we need to reach the social actors, policy makers, managers that can be potentially interested in our research. They're not going to read the paper, a scientific paper. And we need to increase the visibility of our results. So that's one area of uh, showing what we do and try to make the impact of our findings larger. And with this, I will finish. And that's all this that we've talked about uh, these barriers, unfortunately, have left in the hands of our, uh, our, on our own, so on the individual people to be overcome. But the magnitude of the disadvantages overwhelms the capacity of our individual efforts. So the tips that I was mentioning are super important, but they're not enough to transform the system. And we need then to have measures that are collective and that are institutional to make the academic system more fair, more just, more equitative, more diverse, more collaborative, and more transparent. So there's uh, several um, suggestions out there in the literature to increase these characteristics of the system and make it really more global because we do need a global scientific community to face the global environmental problems and because that's just fair. Thank you everyone for your attention and very happy now to discuss this and have your questions.
Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, thank you, Mariana. Um, I think uh, that you uh, you brought a lot of such uh, important information and context to your talk, and I believe that many points uh, that you covered in your talk uh, resonate with uh, researchers in the global south. So uh, while it's not new, those barriers, uh, especially for researchers in global south, it's really important to see like influential, uh, influential uh, researchers uh, like you is speaking up about uh, these issues. Um, so thank you so much uh, for Thanks that. Thanks to you, Lorena. And uh, we have a few questions here. Uh, in fact, many questions. I think I will not be able to uh, to uh, to say all of them, but uh, let's start. So uh, the first question is about the language bar barrier that you mentioned. Uh, so language is one of the several barriers uh, for Latino scientists. Scientists, uh, what would be the first step to overcome the insecurity? and the shame that those researchers uh, feel? Well, uh, first, we, we can't avoid learning English. So we these um, artificial intelligence tools help us a lot to write. So they can help us write emails and write papers and read papers. So all the time and effort that takes those activities, we can reduce with AI, but making real contact, personal contact. We do need to speak. And for that, I think first, just practice, practice for Congresses. It requires a lot of energy, I know, and to overcome shyness. But if you were aiming for a poster, let's try to make an oral presentation. Leave the poster for other meetings. If you are going to a big meeting where you know there will be researchers that you like a lot, that you respect, that you would like to interact, try hard to make an oral presentation and practice. Write what you want to say. Write it. Read it. Practice. Practice. It will take time. And that's why it's a barrier. It takes time, energy, a lot of energy. Practice in front of your friends. Record yourself. You, it will be much easier than you think. That's the thing. That will making all this preparation will increase your confidence. That that at least that was my experience. It increases your confidence, and that's what you need. And then, okay, you won't be a British speaker right? when you approach this researcher that you want to talk with. It's fine. Most people are. There are nice. Most people will make an effort to communicate, to understand you, even if your if your English is not perfect. None of the English of anyone is, of us is perfect, right? We need to try. So practice just to overcome this level of shyness, and then it will be fine. Invite that researcher for a caipirinha, a beer, and say, "Look, I really would like to share my work with you. I have this." ideas, I have these questions. You will see that most people will be happy to have a, a, a chat with you. And who knows, that may open doors for future collaborations. Maybe start with a fellow peer. Maybe don't go directly to the full professor, but to the top scientist. Maybe, maybe, it depends, it's up to you. But your fellow peers, people that are more or less your age, medium career, so that decreases the pressure, I would think. But just try. Forget the poster. Go for oral. Talk in the corridor of the congresses. Write an email and say, I would like to make a stay in your lab. Can I do it? Can you help me find the resources? I don't have money, but I would, I would be willing to be part of any of your projects. Just be proactive. That will, that will open some doors, I'm sure. Yeah, it's really good tips. Take the risk, uh, I think. Yeah. Uh, and one thing that I usually um, try to think about when I am in those situations, like conferences, and uh, I usually think, okay, I'm here speaking English, but I also speak Portuguese, and I also understand Spanish. So I don't, I don't need to be shamed, you know, because I'm doing a lot. So I think this is a good. Uh, 
it's a good way to to think and give more confidence um, regarding the the language. So uh, our next question is: uh, We often receive criticisms about the method me uh, methods uh, that we use in our research. Most of the time, this limitation is due to financial limitations. For example, how to overcome this? The methods, yeah, that's a that's a huge problem because we don't have the resources, we don't have the infrastructure, or Sometimes when there is a government that uh, wants to invest in science, we buy equipment, next government doesn't want to invest anymore, the equipment uh, gets broken, but there's no money to fix it, and that's it. A full research line gets stuck. That happens, and we need to acknowledge that and be aware of that. And for that, there are some suggestions. One is collaboration. That's why we need to collaborate, because there are places in the world that are, have plenty of resources and that are also happy to collaborate. So the more connections we have, the higher chances we have to get some money from outside and help us improve the equipment, improve the methods that are expensive and so on. But also high quality research is not necessarily dependent on expensive equipment. It's mostly about the ideas, the theories, and what do we see that it's, uh, what, what's our contribution? So we can sort out, if we don't have money, and we know we won't have money to buy the super expensive equipment that we need, then let's move around that. And if we don't have an international collaborator that could help us with funding, then let's just make our life easier. We can do fantastic top quality research that is not so demanding on equipment. We can do that. There's a lot of things there that are enormous databases that are available. We have satellite images yeah. available. We have yeah. decades of research done by colleagues that are have been collecting data for descriptive purposes, just to know what it's, uh, has never been done in a place. That's a question there. So we need to describe what happens, what are the patterns that in our ecosystems, we do need that. But with that data, we could use it to ask questions that are super relevant for different theories, for example. So there's also a mismatch between the advancement of ecological theory and the empirical data. We often have empirical data collected for different purposes, for monitoring, and we can use it with the right questions and produce very high quality top scientific publications. So that's what we need to overcome these difficulties because these difficulties are common to the global south, right? We're used to that. Yeah. And we uh, that should give us resilience. We're used yes. to political chaos. We're used to lack of resources. We know that, and then we have we have learned to survive being researchers in the global south with all these external variability and external pressures and even collapses. So let's use that resilience that we have built on ourselves and in our communities and use what we have to produce this top science. And we, when we do that, when we get ourselves in the loop we get ourselves visible, then more people would want to collaborate with us. And that's how to break, remember, this cycle of feedback that makes the yeah. North being more successful and makes the South being stuck in problems. We need to break it. And to break it, we need to have some measure through a few, let's say, important publications or reaching the people that could, that could be interested in collaborating with us. And for that, we need to show that we're doing good science. And then we will attract interest. And then we'll, that will help us overcome our own economic barriers and contextual barriers. And the same would go for the question of Sylvia that I seen in the chat, that very often we see the question that the topics that we are doing are not new, but they are done for the first time for a country or even for South America. Uh, 
I agree, and that was one of the that's one of the points of most often rejection. That is not new. It's not new for the science, and that's because it's that idea that science. It's what the global north scientists have said. It is, or that's the knowledge, the accepted knowledge. But we need to challenge that because very often our ecosystems don't follow the same rules as the ecosystems in different climates or that have experienced different levels of anthropogenic impact or the level of impact is different here or this new impact, whatever, right? So we have, we have to use our differences to make our work more interesting, more appealing. And then we, it's a, we practice, right? It's something that you learn by practicing, by how you would uh, ask yourself, how would I explain what's new in my work to somebody that thinks they know everything? Because that's the attitude, yes, right? That's a good point. <laughs> yeah. So they think they know everything. Well, no, they don't. And we need to understand the functioning of the whole world if we want to solve the planetary challenge that we are facing. So what's new? What's your contribution? Why we need to study this place for the first time? Why is it relevant? So what is it, the knowledge that we produce, what is it adding to the accepted knowledge? Or on the contrary, is it challenging? The accepted knowledge? Are we building new theories? Very often we are. Yeah. So let's just don't assume that they will be interested because it's new. We need to convince why is it relevant to everyone. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, do you have time to answer just one more question? Uh, yes. Here's a re yes. really interesting question here in the chat. So yeah, we often export our students to other countries uh, because we lack jobs and resource. Do you have a tip on how to motivate them to keep working uh, with global uh, South issues? Yeah, thanks, Simone, for your question. That's that's something that uh, we are global South countries. We are. It's funny that that's not listed when we list all the commodities that we export, like, like raw materials food yes. we are not listing scientists and that's something that we are really exporting we are losing we are bleeding the young and super strong and promising scientists that are taken very rapidly by other places because of course we are we have a good education and we are trained in these difficulties that make us as i said very resilient, very adaptive, very flexible. Those are characteristics that are fantastic in the academia, right? And we're not afraid of hard work. We're not afraid of not yeah. having resources. We're used to that. And in my experience, most people want to keep working. They don't need a motivation to keep working with the Global South issues because their heart is in the Global South, right? And most people that go abroad and uh, from my own experience and from experience near me, we all want to go back. And if we can't, because there's no opportunity, we do want to collaborate. We do want to keep the link. And that means we need both from both sides, from the people that went abroad to maintain the links. That's an, again, it's extra effort. Everything is extra effort. Unfortunately, we know that. And we have to cope with that extra effort that we need to yeah, to give, let's say. But people outside, keep the links from your original country. Keep the links with your original lab and your supervisor and your fellow students, your friends, your colleagues. And for those that remain in the South, invite those that went abroad to be part invite them to join in the papers, invite to be external researchers in your in your team. So let's don't lose or try to lose the less possible. Because I'm sure the motivation is there. It's mostly the opportunity. Some people can say or may say, I left, maybe they don't want to work with me anymore. I'm too busy now, but I would like to contribute, but I don't want to be uh, patronizing. 
and it's not we we need everyone to be in this right so it's more to say the doors are open and we need each other to contribute with each other so that's super important thank you simone for for mentioning this yeah, that's that's super important. It's a very common question among researchers that are abroad, and I I am I'm really glad um, about your answer. And yeah, it's a, and try to also do our best, you know, to create those opportunities because many researchers would like to come back to their countries. Indeed. And I can speak by myself. I just I just want an opportunity to come back. So. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Mariana. Uh, if we have more questions, we can send the questions to Mariana and then she can yes, answer please. later. Yeah, uh, it was very interesting. Uh, thank you, everyone, uh, for being here. Thank you, Mariana, uh, thank for you, finding everyone. time to be here with us and uh, give us such a great tips um, and also a lot of things to, to think about and consider. So thank you. Thanks to everyone. Um, See you in the next talk. And yes, in the Congress, exactly. Hopefully. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So next week we are gonna uh, have another our last workshop from our series, and uh, will be the uh, we Rita uh, Rita Franco Santos uh, will be here, and she will be here talking about open access. And she has a huge expertise. Uh, she is a early career researcher, um, but she has a, a really um, uh, huge involvement uh, with editorial uh, work. So she will be here giving some tips, explain first, thing, first what is open access and also give some tips uh, for us. So we hope to see everyone here next week. Uh, and thank you again, Mariana. Thank you, Andrea. Bye, everyone. Bye, everyone. See you next week.